And today I'm very pleased to have some of my very own team members present on the topic of virtual care for seniors. Dr. Barbara Liu is the Executive Director of the RGP of Toronto. She is also Division Director of Geriatric Medicine at the University of Toronto and a practicing geriatrician at Sunnybrook Health Sciences Centre. Caitlin Brandon is a project manager at the RGP and myself, Alakia Johnson, I'm the Knowledge to Practice Manager at the RGP. And lastly, we have a very special guest joining us to represent the patient and caregiver perspective, and that is Dr. Janice Baker. Janice sits on a number of patient and family advisory councils, both provincially and regionally, and she is also a registered psychologist. Before we get started with our content, I just wanted to state that we have no conflicts of interest. We receive funding from a variety of sources, including the Toronto region and Central Region of Ontario Health, as well as the Canadian Frailty Network. And Dr. Liu has received an honorarium from St. Elizabeth Health. So without further ado, I would just like to jump into our learning objectives for, the, for this session today. So thank you to all of you who submitted challenges and key questions in your registration form. That was very helpful for us. And we hope that at the end of this webinar, you will be able to do the following. Describe key recommendations for senior-friendly virtual care. Describe a five-step algorithm for how to triage seniors for virtual care. And then lastly, access and use some digital tools for virtual cognitive assessments. So before we go any further, I'd like to ask Sarah. Sarah, would you launch the first poll? So we wanted to get a sense of what is your confidence level when it comes to conducting virtual care with seniors? So we'll ask you a couple of questions on that. And the first one is about video visits. So go ahead and fill that out. Okay, wonderful. So it sounds like the majority of folks say they are somewhat confident with video visits. So thank you for that feedback and we will, we will take that back to the team and incorporate that in our future uh, webinars in this series on virtual care. Thank you. So Sarah, if you could launch the second poll on telephone visits. Interesting. Okay, so once again, the majority of you have said you are somewhat confident with the telephone as well. So that is great feedback. And that is the reason we're doing this series. We hope to equip you with the recommendations and tools to implement virtual care with seniors. So thanks, everyone. First on our agenda, we wanted to talk about senior friendly virtual care recommendations. And so over the past month, the RGP has actually conducted some interviews with older adults and caregivers just to understand what is their lived experience when it comes to virtual care? What feedback do they have? What, how can the experience be improved? Uh, so we compile that information from older adults and caregivers. And we also looked at peer reviewed literature to find out if there were any tips or suggestions for providers. And all of that has been summarized in a handy two page reference document that you will actually get access to shortly. So in terms of reviewing those recommendations with you today, we thought instead of doing a traditional PowerPoint, why not present that through a conversation with an older person. And so Janice Baker actually sat down with me last week and I'm going to play for you uh, a bit of that conversation in a video in just a few moments. And the video starts with us talking about the importance of trust and how 
uh, how to build that trust and why it's so important for seniors. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank you for, uh, you know, inviting me to be part of the webinar, Alexia. Um, I think it's so important because seniors or older adults, you know, uh, grew up in a very interpersonal, social, face-to-face uh, -face world where uh, trust could be determined or established through uh, eye contact, tone of voice, and body language. and. Um, our generation, at least, is, is genetically wired to be social. Um, so I think that, um, you know, many of these cues um, are often missing in the virtual world. And especially if we're talking on the phone. So I think trust is so important. It is formed uh, through a working alliance between the provider and the patient. And I think the foundation of a good working alliance emanates from trust. And so I think it's really critical for us to realize uh, that when a good working alliance is formed, then the, the senior or the older person you know, it, they're more likely to listen. And I think that's key. They're more likely to listen to the provider and, and listen to the recommendations they make and then cooperate and comply with make, following the next steps. Well, I, I think there's a number of things that uh, providers can do to help patients make a good working alliance. Um, you know, even if it's just one visit, for example. Um, you know, I think the first thing is to provide them with as much information as possible ahead of the visit. So if the older person needs to know who is calling them and what the purpose of the visit is about. So I think, secondly, uh, the provider, if they can give them a sense of, you know, how long the visit might be, and you know how much time is available to um, ask questions. But I think the number one ingredient of forming a good rapport is to listen to the senior, to listen to the senior, um, to help them elaborate on you know any changes in their health. Um, and, and that may seem obvious to those of us who provide health care. Through COVID, I've had uh, many of my senior friends um, say to me that they feel like the, the healthcare provider is uh, kind of talking down to them or, or kind of lecturing them. Um, and I think we have to remember that many seniors, you know, have good or reasonable cognitive skills. Now, for those that don't have, you know, uh, good cognitive skills or have some type of impairment, then I think in those instances, you know, we need to ensure that there's a caregiver that helps and assists with the technology. Um, so uh, I think the other thing, if, if continuity of care can be provided for the senior. So for example, one of my doctors during COVID said she checked back with me about my concern. And as a senior, I found that extremely uh, reassuring. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Those are some excellent points and your, your point around providing key information ahead of the appointment is is uh, you know an easy thing that, that providers can do as well. So what specific information do you think that older adults want to know ahead of their virtual appointment? Well I think if it, you know again if it's the first time meeting then they need to know uh, the healthcare provider's full name. And, uh, and that's important because often they'll go to another meeting and they'll say, well, oh, Jessica, Jessica who, <laughs> you know? So the full name um, and, you know, their job title, if that's relevant, and possibly some of their uh, professional uh, degrees 
and you know maybe even a photo uh, like many provide people provide on the net but um, maybe how long they've been practicing and, and because a lot of those details one would see if you're meeting in an office in a face-to-face -face meeting so I think you, we want to try to uh, duplicate or replicate that as much as possible in virtual care and and then even if the you know some providers are comfortable I mean, even sharing a little bit about um, their own personal um, life or, or some of their interests. I think those things, particularly with older adults, really help build rapport and, uh, and um, cement a relationship. So I think another thing um, that is helpful to uh, know is to let the person uh, for example, no, um, somehow be informed if uh, the appointment is running significantly late. I and mean, that can be done through a number of, you know, in a number of ways. Um, and I think um, that's important because then the senior doesn't become anxious or, or agitated uh, because, you know, getting on the phone or virtual care is all you know, new for them. And so it, it's natural for them to be a bit anxious. Um, because during the pandemic, many of my senior, senior friends, <laughs> okay, uh, you know, told me they were given an appointed time, but um, they weren't called, you know, for many hours afterwards. And that, um, that they found, um, you know, um, disruptive to their lives. Okay, um, I think, of course, as we all know, one needs to also establish the purpose of the meeting at the outset and uh, ask the older adult, you know, older adults, sorry, where possible, um, you know, what they'd like to achieve or get out of the meeting, because uh, I think that helps build the trust and rapport uh, with the provider. Um, so, and if the patient raises something that doesn't seem germane or, or to the purpose of the meeting, then the healthcare provider can just clarify again why they're they're talking with them. And and I, I think you know um, even before the provider gives them recommendations, you know uh, about maybe a new treatment or a new medication they'd like to re recommend or or referral to someone else. I think it's really important to uh, to make sure the provider knows that they understand their condition. You know, because they can go away and not really sure what they're suffering from or their issue is. So I think uh, it's important to ensure that the patient understands their condition and then the healthcare provider can reflect back a little and, and hear and respond to any cues to, you know, to make sure the person is following the conversation. So those are just a few things that Ooh, I think would be helpful. Excellent, excellent suggestions. And, and so many of those we've actually incorporated in our recommendations for providers. So thank you so much. What about after the appointment? What kind of information should an older adult have access to afterwards? Well, I think in healthcare in general, we need to find improved ways to um, make sure the patient has access to all the information they need to take action for the next steps. I could speak to some examples that I've been involved with with this, but um, w one ideal way would be to, um, you know, um, may seem unrealistic, but I actually had it happen recently, is to provide a, a summary or a checklist, um, you know, of what was discussed and what to expect next. Um, and, um, you know, things like if and when an, another appointment is, is required so that the patient then doesn't have to follow up on their own. So, so things like that become very helpful and also transferable to family or or to the memory <laughs> you know mm -hmm. memory becomes more of an issue for seniors right <laughs> excellent um so switching gears a little bit one of the themes that came up repeatedly when we chatted with older adults was the importance of the physical setting so 
where the person is actually sitting and participating in virtual care. And, um, you know, the feedback was that providers really need to be uh, mindful of that setting. So I know you had some, some thoughts around this. Why is that so important? Well, I think sometimes some of us don't uh, recognize a, a real issue that often exists, which is the reason for this is the incidence of elder care and elder abuse that can occur. And so it, it might be very difficult for um, the elder person to um, really discuss their private concerns, whether they're physical or mental. Uh, and so if possible, uh, I've even myself asked them to go to a private room, um, you know, by themselves where others can't hear them. Uh, and um, and I, I think also in this process, it, it, you know, can all, it's not always easy, but I think it's important to ensure that the person assisting them uh, the senior is a trustworthy person as well. Uh, somehow um, that can certainly be done over time. Um, now, if there happens to be unfortunately any serious concerns about you know, privacy or security, then I think the older person should be directed to meet face to face with the healthcare provider and, or at least given the option of attending uh, in person alone with perhaps the family member sitting in the waiting room. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And that, that's a, a great reminder as well that it's not virtual is one option. It's not the only option. So, so this has been a really insightful conversation. So any, any final comments, Janice, anything you want to leave us with? Well, I think, you know, when you did your interviews, we know that um, many of the co positive comments you had back were that virtual care can save time and, and effort for both the provider and, you know, uh, the person receiving uh, the health, health consultation. Um, and so I think, for example, you know, issues that could be resolved easily, like if, you know, uh, a physician, you know, um, prescribing uh, online and, and sending that off can help save um, dollars for, for healthcare. Uh, but I think it's also very important not to necessarily assume that virtual care will assume, um, sorry, will take and save those valuable healthcare dollars uh, because I have, um, you know, uh, again, through my senior friends, you know, examples of where they had, you know, good consultations with their, their healthcare providers over the phone. And then they recommended they use telehealth, which they did, but the, they still didn't have any um, definitive direction. And, and it wasn't until they were able to have, you know, one face-to-face -face meeting that they got the proper diagnosis and, um, you know, uh, follow up and next steps. So, um, so I think we have to, uh, you know, weigh the pluses and minuses always and not, you know, and, and look at the use of, of effective use of virtual care. So, um, so I, you know, I'd like to thank you uh, in ending, um, you know, the, geri the geriatric program of Toronto for allowing me to speak uh, to some of the many issues that uh, we need to consider to provide the best lived experiences for those uh, when we're providing virtual care. Wonderful, thank okay. you again. Thank you. Yes. So I hope that you found that conversation insightful. And I'm now going to ask Sarah, Sarah, could you please post the link to the recommendations resource in the chat box? So you can all download that right away. You will also receive that in an email following this webinar. And you'll see that there are a number of recommendations there that uh, co cover additional topics that were not in, in this interview as well. So the interview was a bit of a teaser for you. All right, so you're probably wondering, great, you've given us these recommendations, how are we going to implement them? 
and the RGP is committed to developing tools and resources to help you with that implementation. And first up, our very first tool is the Virtual First Algorithm. And I'm going to ask Caitlin Brandon to walk you through this. Thanks, Alekia, and uh, thank you to all of you who are here and on the line with us today. Um, you know, I think that uh, for clinicians in all areas of care across the whole system, you know, COVID-19 has really thrust virtual care upon everyone very quickly. Um, we were all forced to adapt to a world in which many services, um, particularly ambulatory geriatric services, had to close their doors to in-person uh, patient visits. And video and phone were really the only methods, you know, other than for emergency services that we could connect with our patients. Um, and uh, so while adoption of these modalities, you know, really came out of necessity, um, we, we strongly do believe that they are here to stay. So uh, while a learning curve might be involved, um, you know, in gaining comfort and confidence, um, the use of video and phone as a first choice for initial assessment um, really offers the opportunity for specialized geriatric services to reconsider some of the ways in which they function um, and ways in which services can work a little more closely together um, to gain efficiencies uh, while also benefiting the patient and their caregivers. So this is really a, a new way forward. So the model uh, outlines steps to determine when and how a patient referred to specialized geriatric services can be seen for an initial assessment by a member of the interprofessional team. Um, it provides an opportunity for a collaborative one team approach between available ambulatory services at a particular site. And um, it provides the decision making process for seeing patients preferably by virtual means. Um, but as Alekia um, and Janice both uh, alluded to in the video that we just watched, uh, you know, this does not discount the role and the option for in-person visits. Um, as always, you know, clinical judgment and consideration for the wishes and preferences of your patient, um, they remain an integral part of, of any decision-making process in this regard. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, you know, virtual care is going to play a role long after the pandemic is over. So this, uh, this model or this algorithm was developed uh, based on input from a really wide range of sources. Um, there's elements that pull from our previous work, the RGP's previous work on rapid access to um, cognitive geriatric assessment. Um, it includes feedback from our specialized geriatric service open pandemic meeting that I'm sure a number of you on the line have participated in um, that was started up at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, it's from the dedicated work and the insight of members of the Reimagine SGS working group. And uh, just as um, the video that we watched, um, we've taken very uh, seriously into consideration um, messaging and information that we've heard from patients and caregivers. So uh, the initial assessment is uh, or can be performed by most members of an interprofessional team, uh, geriatric team. And the initial assessment would include the core elements of the comprehensive geriatric assessment. It would include initial recommendations. And um, once that initial assessment is complete, it's at this point that it would stream a patient really to the most appropriate next step. Um, and as you can see on the slide here, you know, that may include um, the following specialized geriatric services, where it be uh, the clinic, the day hospital, outreach, potentially geriatric psychiatry, um, or it may be another service, um, whether it be in the community or back with primary care. Next slide. So we'll get into the steps here. Um, so step one involves verifying whether the referral is still needed. And we've heard from many programs um, that there really is a significant backlog in referrals due to COVID, um, the closures that happened and the redeployment of uh, SGS staff to other roles within, um, within their site or hospital. 
So um, as services and teams, you know, start to catch up on that list of referrals, um, or as they're able to book appointments for referrals that may have been sitting there for a significant amount of time, um, connecting with the referral source really is a, a first step. And um, doing a review of information that is available on Connecting Ontario can really provide uh, a history on who the patient has seen um, and any pertinent test results that might be available. Uh, step two helps to determine the urgency of the referral. So um, there is a set of just four criteria listed there. And uh, if any of the following or any of those uh, items um, are present, then the patient may be considered to uh, be streamed to a more urgent stream and seen within a two week period. And um, just wanted to note that that uh, two week criteria was based upon um, the RGP and the associated working groups uh, previous project on, on rapid access to CGA um, when a patient is deemed uh, to be in more of an urgent, not an emergency situation, but um, needing to be seen a little more quickly. And if the following uh, items are not present, um, then they would be steamed, uh, streamed to the wait list. Next slide. And step three of the algorithm is really broken down into a three-part decision tree. Um, so this is to determine the mode of the initial assessment. And this is where we really get into that virtual first idea. Um, so uh, the first step would be to ask the patient whether they have uh, access to the appropriate technology to connect by video, um, as well as whether or not they're comfortable using that technology. Um, if the answer is no, uh, there may potentially be an organizational technology kit, depending on your organization and what resources it has available that may be delivered to the patient. So if the answer here is yes, they have the technology or you're able to send them a technology kit, then you can proceed with booking a video appointment. And if the answer is no, then we move on to step B. And here uh, we are asking if uh, there are any individuals, um, be it a trusted family member, friend, caregiver, who might have access uh, and also be comfortable using video technology. So is there somebody there that could assist them with using it? And this step also includes the exploration of a potential healthcare provider who might be attending the patient in their home who has access to or could assist with the technology. Um, and I just wanna uh, make a note on, on the point of another healthcare provider, um, just that exploring this option, it, it, you know, it might offer the opportunity to perform, addition, um, sorry, perform different or additional um, assessments that might otherwise only be done if the patient were to be seen in person by specialized geriatric services. So if someone else is available and has the technology, um, then once again, go ahead uh, and proceed with booking a video appointment. And if the answer is no, then we move on to step C. Step C asks whether the patient has the ability to do the initial assessment by phone. Um, there may be cognitive issues or otherwise that might make a phone appointment uh, not optimal. And from an equity perspective, um, some patients may not have a phone plan that makes you know, a lengthy uh, initial assessment, something that may last uh, an hour, an hour and a half or more. It may not be economically feasible for them to do that. Uh, certainly some plans, um, depending on their socioeconomic situation, uh, are pay as you go and it would be pay per minute and it just doesn't make it feasible for that patient. So if the answer to the question is yes, it is reasonable and, um, uh, and feasible to do the appointment over the phone, then go ahead and book a phone appointment. And if the answer is no, then you would proceed to booking uh, an appointment in person. And once a patient has had their initial assessment and the core components of the CGA have been completed, um, a clinical decision can be made around those next best steps uh, and which service um, might be of uh, best benefit to the patient as, uh, as the next place to go. Um, and once again, it, it may be back to primary care or it may be a, a service in the community as well. Next slide. 
And lastly, we've included some waitlist mitigation ideas. So uh, what you see here on the slide is certainly by no means an exhaustive list, but it provides a few suggestions when the waitlist for a particular program is especially long. And certainly at this point in time, uh, we know that for the same uh, sorry, for the same issues mentioned earlier around the backlog of referrals, um, waitlists have grown um, significantly in some areas as a result of those closures and redeployments throughout the pandemic. So uh, specialized geriatric service clinicians, you know, you have a wealth uh, of knowledge on services that may benefit the patient during an interim period before they can actually be seen by your service. Uh, and offering some of this information may really go a long way to assisting and supporting those who can't be seen right away. So services might include community supports or other care providers such as primary care, care of the elderly physicians or, or other OHT partners. And uh, connecting with a patient's primary care provider may be another excellent uh, avenue to share your expertise and offer support to primary care in a knowledge sharing capacity um, that will help them support that patient until SGS is available to see them. And certainly providing patients and their caregivers with information on how to get in touch if there's any change in the patient status uh, is also important. So uh, along the way, perhaps things change and that patient may be um, considered for that more urgent stream. So this algorithm, uh, you know, it, it provides uh, the decision making steps for seeing a patient for that initial assessment. Um, and as Lekia also mentioned, we will be certainly building upon this algorithm um, in parts two and three of the webinar series that are coming up, um, where we will offer some more guidance on how to apply the senior friendly care recommendations um, to the booking process, uh, the appointment and to the follow up. So uh, Sarah, if you mind um, posting the link to the uh, one page um, algorithm, um, this will be a printer friendly version, not, uh, not slide split as, uh, as it is here in today's presentation, but a nice printer friendly version of the algorithm and, uh, and the link will be posted there in the chat. So the next piece um, that I will continue on here with is around the cognitive assessment digital download package. And um, before I share my screen and show some of the uh, components of it, um, I just wanted to give everybody a little bit of background. So um, performing uh, cognitive assessments virtually has been a recurring theme throughout the pandemic and something that um, many, uh, many of you have brought up as a challenge. So uh, the RGP um, has developed some resources um, and we've really pulled together information and recommendations um, presented by various experts on the topic. Um, so our goal here was to create uh, an easily downloadable package that includes tips on performing two of the most widely used assessments. So the MMSE and the Montreal Cognitive Assessment. Um, so tips on how to perform those two cognitive assessments by phone or by video. Um, and, you know, as always, uh, we leave it to the clinical judgment um, of each individual clinician to decide the most appropriate cognitive assessment to use with any particular patient. Um, so the following is really a, a handy reference tool uh, and tip sheet to be used. So let me just share what it looks like with you. So the first component of the package is a two page tip sheet for conducting the MMSE and the MOCA. Um, this resource provides recommendations on how to alter uh, the standard instructions for each test and to make them applicable in a virtual format. Um, and that uh, the tips here uh, cover for virtual uh, by video or virtual by phone. 
So they provide prompts for sections uh, where screen sharing of images by video um, allows for execution of the assessment. Um, and so there are sections such as the naming section here that we see on the MMSE side of the tip sheet. So it goes over things like you open the image file, which I'll be showing you just momentarily, um, using the screen share option to share images with the patient, asking the patient to name the objects that they see, moving forward in the slide image by image. Um, and then once you arrive to the last image, in this case, an image of the pen, then at that point you click stop screen share. Leaving that file open because we've tried to make it as easy and, and uh, user friendly as possible. Um, you continue on with some of the other aspects of the assessment. And then once again, um, at the read and follow section, um, where you're instructing the patient to close their eyes, you would once again open your screen share, show the image where it has those words of close your eyes um, and continue the assessment from there. So there is a few sections in here that involve images and we have put those together for you so that there's no searching involved. They're all there together in one file uh, quick, as a quick reference. The second side goes over some recommendations for performing the Montreal Cognitive Assessment. So the top section covers some of the information um, uh, about doing the assessment by phone. So the MOCA does have um, a, a blind test and it has been validated for use over the phone. Um, so if you are doing a phone assessment, the uh, MOCA test blind um, is a, a wonderful option and you have the confidence in knowing that it has been validated for use in that context. Um, one item that uh, has come up as a question for some is around uh, the vigilance piece. Um, so asking a patient when they're on the phone to uh, take a pen and tap the phone receiver when they hear the letter A. The second section goes over some uh, video tips. So once again, um, the image files will uh, provide you with those preset images that are ready and in the appropriate order and gives you instructions for when and how to screen share and when to close those screen sharing. So I'll just show the image file quickly here. <coughs> so the file here includes all of the images that would be required for either the MMSC or the MOCA. The first section covers the MMSC images, a watch, a pen, close your eyes, and copy this design. And the section, sec second section goes over the MOCA images. So this is the mini trails, uh, the cube, and the three images of the lion, the rhinoceros, and the camel. So Sarah, if you can provide a link there in the chat box to those two documents, the tip sheet and the image file, and those will be ready for the group to download. And at this point, I think we're going to move on to the virtual care question and answer. Excellent. Thank you so much, Caitlin. That was fantastic. So for this portion of the webinar, I would like to invite Dr. Barbara Liu, Janice Baker uh, to join us. So what we've done is we, we really did comb through all of the questions and challenges that you all submitted in your registration form. And we pulled out the frequently, the top five frequently asked questions. And so we're going to now answer those in a more direct way. So we'll, we'll start uh, going through those one by one. And Caitlin, if you could just pause the screen share. Fantastic. And feel free to turn on your videos. 
Excellent. So the first question, how diagnostically accurate is a virtual cognitive assessment? So we'll throw that one out to you. Thanks, Alek. Yeah. So I think this is a, um, a question that a lot of us are struggling with because really none of this has been validated other than as was mentioned, the mocha blind is validated for use on the telephone, but we haven't really established um, whether doing virtual assessment, cognitive assessments virtually is equivalent to doing it in person. We're sort of working on our best clinical judgment right now. I know that there are some people looking at this as a research question, but I, as far as I know, we don't have the answer to that is, um, just at the moment. So I think we're relying a lot on our, our best clinical judgment and skills as communicators and as clinicians to be able to do the cognitive assessment virtually, either by phone or by video. Excellent. Thank you for, for diving into that one. So the next question is, how can we assist seniors who do not have access to the internet or devices? So this one came up a lot. This is, I know this is on everyone's minds. Um, I'll, um, I'll offer to uh, hop in on this one. Um, there's certainly a lot of examples um, of, uh, you know, across the system of how this can be done. Um, there's a few sites who have been sort of um, very forward thinking and creative um, in terms of doing things like sending iPhones out to patients to use on a temporary basis to help with uh, care management or with virtual uh, virtual appointments. Um, so that's something certainly that organizationally could be considered. Wonderful. Um, Barbara, anything to add for that one? Sorry about that. Uh, no, I was just uh, wondering if Janice wanted to um, offer any comments. Janice? Don't know if uh, she's having some... Well, well Janice is wait, uh, well, we're waiting to see if Janice can unmute. I guess the, the concern has been raised that access to technology is now a new determinant of health and uh, there's been a call for um, action around um, policy change or advocacy to make sure that older adults in particular have access to this um, mode of receiving health care. And I think that there are innovative things happening in terms of lending libraries and uh, you mentioned the technology kit. Um, and I don't know if any people on the line um, have uh, experience with using loaned out technology or technology kits to help support their clients um, if you do, then please share your experiences with us in the chat box. Absolutely. Please do enter any comments or questions that you have as we're going through these questions. And in addition to, you know, the actual technology, I do know of one site that has actually given out phone cards to, uh, to their patients and sort of said, you know, take this, we'll, we'll call you, you know, in two weeks from now, and it's, it's sort of a planned, um, you know, uh, thing, and, and it's been incredibly successful at that particular site, and they're looking to expand that. So lots of creativity and, and, uh, and ways to move forward. And I'll, I'll just note it, um, uh, Kim, Kim Day uh, had the question in the chat box around how you ma manage the Wi-Fi for loaner kits. So um, in the experience that, um, the experiences that we have heard about from sites who have been doing this, um, they do include some sort of a, a Wi-Fi, you know, a, a rocket stick, um, essentially, a, you know, a network card, some way to connect to the network. Um, and the cost of that is is covered by the site that is sending those kits out. And many of them have uh, solicited uh, partnerships with providers as a, um, uh, uh, a donation uh, of that rocket stick with a, like TELUS or Rogers or some such provider. Wonderful, thanks Kim for that question. Please keep them coming. So the next question is around, how do we assist seniors who are uncomfortable with technology? Well, I, I, I can offer some, some um, 
possible experiences with this is that um, partnering with other people, whether it's friends or family, neighbors, but as Janice pointed out, they have to be somebody that's trustworthy, um, that the, the client themselves uh, trusts, and they are the ones that are, have to make the ultimate decision if it's appropriate to have them assist with the visit. Um, if they are capable of making that uh, designation. Uh, I guess the other thing is um, opportunities where if, it, if they're not comfortable, as you said in the, in the webinar, it's not either or. People still need to get care and they should be um, offered an in-person visit with maximum opportunities to, um, you know, um, have distancing and appropriate PPE and minimizing the risk to them as well as to us. And one of the things that you could do in that opportunity is to have them do a room to room video conference with the provider. So they're coming in for an in-person assessment, but the part where there's a lot of talking could be done with zooming uh, from room to room. That also gives them a little bit of a taste of the virtual interface and maybe that could be a gentle on ramp for them to um, potentially be able to use it uh, at some point in the future. And then also you could have your assistant um, there to um, troubleshoot for them in terms of um, showing them the technology that minimizes the, the time spent together enclosed in a small clinic room um, and helps minimize the risk. Then you can come in, they've already seen your face on the video, come in with your PPE on to do the essential pieces of the physical examination that you can't do up, uh, obviously through the video. And um, I know that, um, I, that this idea came from other providers in the field, many of you who might be on the call. And uh, I think it's a, 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 great, a great way for um, getting the clinical assessment done, but also offering a little bit of technology um, coaching to the client. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I'll, I'll pick up on that. Um, certainly there, there are some organizations out there as well that uh, are able to provide free technical support. Um, so one in the city at least is called Tech Serve TO. Um, and they, they help support um, those who are needing assistance with using technology. Um, and uh, to pick up on uh, something that uh, also came up in the chat there, uh, there are some sites who are using their existing volunteer pool, um, particularly at the time when volunteers uh, were, were not able to come into the hospital sites to, to do that volunteer work, but um, they've solicited them and asked who who might be interested and available and comfortable um, with being trained to be technical support people for those who are doing virtual appointments. So it's another option to, to utilize that volunteer pool that your site may have already. Mm -hmm. Excellent. And on the point around volunteers, I'll just speak for Janice. I know she, she really wanted to be here. I think she's having some t technical issues, but um, uh, she had the fantastic idea about using adolescents who need volunteer credits and how can we tap into that resource uh, base, you know, in terms of uh, volunteer pools for, for various organizations, how can we include adolescents because, uh, you know, they do need those, those high school credits and that. So wonderful. And our last question here is how, 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 how can we accommodate those with impairments? So hearing, cognitive, and visual impairments. Uh, so the usual things that we try to do in person, you know, speaking um, clearly, slowly, enunciating. Um, also, something that you saw during the interview that Alekia did with Janice was um, the visual cues um, to acknowledge when the person is speaking and to maybe exaggerate some of those movements so that they're they're perceived and, and picked up on during the video conference. Some of the challenges um, uh, related to um, the, um, the view of the video is uh, that when you're looking at the person's face on the video screen, you're not looking at the camera. It's very hard to look at the camera and also pick up on the cues that you might be getting from the person's facial expression. So, um, maybe at the beginning of the video visit, it's good to just clarify that with the person. I'm, I'm looking at you on the screen. I may not be looking at the camera, but I am paying attention to you. And also that your gaze may 
may move away from the camera as well um, to write notes and maybe show them what that looks like. I may be looking down away from the camera, but I'm, I'm making notes during our, our visit. So just so that people know that you're staying connected um, and do the best that you can to optimize that, um, that communication. Mm -hmm. Caitlin, were you gonna jump in? Yeah, I think um, uh, it's also, you know, important and sometimes uh, particularly, I think, because of our, um, our, our, our new comfort level with using a virtual environment is to, um, to remind the patient or to make a note of that to say at the beginning of an appointment with them to ensure that they have their hearing aid in, um, ensure if they need it that they have glasses at hand. I think uh, you froze there a little bit, Caitlin. But um, I'll, I'll jump in there actually with, with an additional point. Um, oh, we, we lost you there, but you're back. So <laughs> all part of the fun of virtual care. Um, so I was gonna jump in with an additional point around hearing impairments. So you might wanna consider actually investing in a headset um, to because it really assists with with optimal audio quality. So don't be afraid of you know um, getting access to different devices or things that can assist. Um, and Caitlin, did you want to finish your point? Anything else to add? I'm not sure how much uh, was heard. It, my point was really just around reminding them at the beginning of an appointment to use any assistive devices that they have available to them. Um, make sure they have their hearing aids in, make sure that they have their glasses ready and available for them. Wonderful. So those were our sort of pre-planned questions. I did want to, um, I wanted to acknowledge uh, Margarita and her comment. So, um, uh, uh, Sarah, if you can, I know it's possible to let, allow people to speak, so I'll, I'll let you perhaps uh, turn that feature on, but I just wanted to acknowledge her comment around the Canadian Patient Safety Institute, and I did see that as well, that they have announced the theme for this year's event is virtual care. So how can we promote patient safety in the virtual environment? I think that's a fantastic question. So um, any, any thoughts from the two of you or anyone else on the line, feel free to enter in the chat box. Or any other questions? We have about five minutes left. Okay. I really like Margarita's um, uh, icon there, or, or <laughs> her flowers, the cherry blossoms. Oh. Margarita, Margarita, are you able to speak? Okay. Well, while we're waiting, I will pull up our final slides, but Margarita, jump in anytime if you're able to uh, get your audio working there. Okay, and I do see that there is a Q&A question. So someone's, uh, thank you, Dean, for your comment. And he says that it is so pertinent to our conversation as a senior to witness um, our senior contributors struggling to connect to audio services. We need to give so much support. Um, absolutely, I agree. It's, you know, and, and we're, and I think it, it, it taps into um, just a theme around, you know, no one's perfect. <laughs> we're, we're all kind of learning together and, and these things do happen from time to time. And we, I think the point around support is key and, and not giving up when, when things don't go perfectly. So, I, Caitlin, any other comments in the chat box that you can see? Uh, no, I think I think we have covered I think we've covered everything. Fantastic. Well, thank you everyone for spending this hour with us. We certainly hope that this was helpful and practical for you and it's just the beginning. We do have a couple more sessions planned. 
Just wanted to say first, please do keep an eye out for our feedback survey. You'll receive that right after this webinar. And please mark your calendars for November 6th and December 4th. We will be diving deeper into some of these topics. So themes around building trust, how to set up an effective virtual visit. Um, you know, we, we will dive deeper. So today was sort of an intro and we also would love to hear from you. If you have additional topics, things that you want us to do a deeper dive, please do reach out and let us know. So that's all for today. Hope you all have a fantastic afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.